Parental nutrition is indicated when the gastrointestinal tract is unavailable for use or is unreliable for more than five to seven days. Of course, enteral nutrition should be the first choice if at all possible because there are very few conditions that prohibit that type feeding. However, total parenteral nutrition is a wonderful advance in medical nutrition therapy because we now can feed people who were once unfeedable. This is an outline of the lecture that we're about to provide. It's a very brief presentation of TPN, also known as Specialized Nutrition Support. I wanted to give you a bit of a historical perspective. Enteral nutrition traces its time to the days when people wrote on papyrus, BC. Mainly they uh, tried rectal feedings, although there were cases where nutrients were introduced with eel-covered whale bones. Sir Christopher Wren in the 1600s was able to introduce feedings into the veins of dogs and keep them alive for a period of time. Also, Dr. Lata treated and saved many cholera patients with what is known basically as a normal saline solution. The modern day era of the history of parental nutrition began in 1937 when a group of researchers published an article where they gave carbs and proteins to a man and kept him alive for an extended period of time. They published a book on their, with their photographs and benefits of, of IV feeding. But again, it was difficult to provide a sufficient amount of calories through a peripheral vein. Later on, a group of physicians successfully fed premature babies who were born with catastrophic gastrointestinal conditions that would not allow them to absorb nutrients. In the late 1960s, the use of IV feeding became very popular in many hospitals throughout the country. It was even adapted for use in the home setting for patients who had permanent bowel dysfunction. Patients could be maintained indefinitely without feeding them as long as they had a central venous access where they could infuse nutrient solutions. In those early days, they had to get their own supplies, mix and hang more than 10 ingredients, have bulky bottles. Today, we have backpack and chest type um, portable pumps and bags of IV solution delivered directly to your door that helps patients maintain full mobility. TPN has been the driving force behind the successful bowel transplant surgeries that we've witnessed uh, an increased rate of in the United States. I won't take the time to read this slide this is a list of absolute indications for parenteral nutrition. Of course, the mantra is if the gut works, use it. And it's always preferred over parenteral nutrition. It's more physiologic, it has less complications, but there are conditions that warrant parenteral nutrition listed here. Generally speaking, if you can't feed a patient by the end of the week and the gut's not working, you need to give them some specialized nutrition support. There are situations where a patient might be given parenteral nutrition earlier. Perhaps you are familiar with the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. They have some excellent publications and they also publish guidelines for feeding. The latest guidelines on feeding your critically ill patients, and again these are the ones that generally will need parenteral nutrition, were published in 2009 as uh, far as I can ascertain on the date of this presentation I'm giving you, which is fall semester of 2013. I'll summarize this most controversial part of the guidelines. It's based on two meta-analysis. Basically they have determined that if you feed a patient parenteral nutrition early or late, you have increased complications in mortality. The ideal window of time seems to be between five and seven days 
if they are well nourished prior to injury. If the patient is not well nourished, you might start early on. There are also contraindications if the person has a functioning GI tract. If treatment anticipated is less than five days, if you can't get a vein, or if the risk is greater than the benefit. What types of risks are there to feeding a patient through a central line? There are long and short-term complications. Most can be avoided by careful patient management, unhurried insertion of the central line by an experienced doctor, and standard line care by proficient nurses to prevent infection. Patients must be monitored closely to address metabolic complications, micro and macronutrient complications, and all medicines should be checked for compatibility with TPN. Patients on home TPN will have more complications, more risk, and require special monitoring. You're probably familiar with this slide. It shows typical access for central line placement. Subclavian site is preferred because skin flora density is much less compared to femoral, jugular, and umbilicus sites. Evidence-based practice research demonstrates that full barrier precautions during tube insertion is most effective to reduce infection. Antimicrobial creams applied to the site are not recommended. TPN preparation must also occur in aseptic conditions. I think perhaps you guys remember last summer that we had a number of deaths that resulted from contaminated TPN being delivered to various hospitals in the southeastern part of the United States. A specialized type of nutrition therapy called PPN is often used when nutrition support is needed for less than two weeks. A high fluid volume is needed to deliver this peripheral nutrition through a peripheral vein, so patients requiring fluid restriction are not candidates for this type of feeding. Patient needs are quite high, 150 mils per hour, so it will limit the use of this uh, type of nutrient delivery to patients with normal renal, cardiac, hepatic, and pulmonary function. Also, PPN solutions are limited to osmolarities of less than six to 900 milliosmoles per liter. Even at these levels, you need to be very uh, cautious and uh, check the line. Basically, Peripheral parenteral nutrition is a protein sparing strategy. We give the patient about 5% dextrose in a peripheral line to minimize tissue catabolism. If a patient demonstrates intolerance, in other words, the nurse is having to move that line around several times within 48 hours, a central line should be considered. This slide lists the pros and cons of peripheral parenteral nutrition. A newcomer to this type of specialized nutrition support is PIC, peripherally inserted central catheters. Basically, a line is threaded from a peripheral vein into a larger vein. They allow for higher osmolarity solutions to be infused. 15 to 2800 osmole solutions. They have multiple lumens. There are pros and cons again. The pros are the patient doesn't have to undergo surgery. A trained RN can uh, put in the line. There's a decreased risk of infection. Unfortunately, it's limited to about one year of use. It can be more difficult for self-care Blood sampling might not be possible. Frequent flushing is required, it can be painful, and there is a higher rate of tube, mal tube malposition. Of course, the oldest and uh, most um, proven type of specialized nutrition support is a PN line. You can use high osmo solutions and they provide full nutrition support and you can use them for years. They do require surgical replacement and removal is more involved and they're very unsightly because of a protruding catheter from the chest. But these lines are often used in home TPN because they can be easier to manage and less likely to become dislodged. 
Sometimes pros and cons are based on the type of catheter that's used. Parenteral nutrition access may also include the femoral artery, but there's a high risk of infection and blood clots. So, all TPN access devices have pros and cons, potential complications that are really beyond the scope of this presentation, but they do include pneumothorax, hemothorax, hydrothorax, arterial sticks, air embolism, nerve injury, occlusion, dislodgement, infection, and thrombosis. Here's a case question. A patient comes in with an occluded line. Which of the following should you not do? Let's go through each one. We certainly should question the patient about signs and symptoms of occlusion. Neck, shoulder pain, and swelling is a definite sign of tube occlusion. Number two, we should always check for tube patency and the ability to aspirate blood. For example, if we're unable to pull blood, it's a fibrin clot on the catheter tip and it can be cleared with the use of a thrombolytic agent. Number three, is there a mechanical cause that a tube could become occluded? Absolutely. A pinch off occlusion happens when the tube is lodged between the rib and clavicle. It's resolved when the patient moves his arm. The catheter will need to be removed and reinserted. Number four, we should use a guide wire to reposition the tube? Absolutely not. So this is the answer to the case question. We should never use a guide wire to reposition the tube. Number five, question the patient on their home care. For example, flushing techniques. Absolutely, improper flushing can contribute to future occluded tubes. We should also assess the patient for edema to make sure that the tube is placed properly. Something that's very important in determining the type of delivery of specialized nutrition support is the osmolarity of the uh, formula that's going to be fed to the patient. Osmolarity dictates the type of access, PPN versus PIC or central line. This slide provides a primer on how to calculate the osmolarity of a parenteral nutrition solution. Again, a peripheral vein for PPN cannot tolerate osmolarities higher than 900. A central line will be needed for patients requiring increased calories. Let's look at the specific ingredients of a parenteral nutrition solution. Protein is generally given as a crystalline form and it provides 4 calories per gram. Concentrations range from 3 to 15 percent. They may vary in the type of amino acids given, but generally 3 to 15 percent is the norm and most are 10 percent. This is because excessive amounts of protein can increase urinary calcium losses. Therefore, it's important to monitor bone health in home TPN. Carbohydrates are generally given in the form of dextrose. They provide 3.4 calories per gram. So, a 20% dextrose concentration has 20 grams per liter and provides 680 calories from carbohydrates. Fat is usually from safflower or soybean oil. A 10% IV fat emulsion has one calorie per meal. A 20% would have two calories per meal. Of course, we provide water, electrolytes, vitamins, and trace minerals. There's a little bit of research out there about the use of soybean oil. There's some research that shows it's actually immunosuppressive. And so uh, there are articles and ongoing research about this. But some labs already avoid soy-based lipid infusions. It's also important to note that IV fat emulsion should not be given to patients with pancreatitis and triglycerides above 400. I want to make one more comment before leaving this slide. 
Aspen does not support the use of one standard formula. Guidelines are based on scientific evidence that patient condition dictates the type of formulation that should be used. There are guidelines for children, critically ill, cardiac, kidney conditions, and others. However, these are the general guidelines for an adult on parenteral nutrition. Most adults will need 30 to 40 mils of kilogram body weight per day for total fluid. They will need 7 grams per kilo per day of carbohydrate, 2.5 grams per kilo per day of fat, and 2 grams per kilogram of body weight per day for protein. So here's a case presentation. A 60-year-old female weighing 45 kilograms is getting parenteral nutrition for a fistula. The formula consists of the following components. 700 mils of dextrose, that's D70, 600 mils of aminosin, and 120 mils of a 20% IV fat emulsion. Which one of the following complications is she at greatest risk for developing? If we look at this 24-hour continuous PN infusion with a total PN volume of electrolytes and additives, it comes out to 1.5 liters. Is she at risk for too much fat, too much protein, hyperglycemia, or too much fluid? Based on our previous slide, The answer is hyperglycemia. Recommendations are for 7 grams per kilogram per day for carbohydrate. In this patient, the carbohydrate should not exceed 315 grams or 171 calories from carb. Her feeding is providing 70 grams of dextrose per 100 ml solution for a total of 490 grams of carb. If you divide 490 by her weight, 45 kilograms, you're getting 10.9 grams of carbohydrate and not 7. The other components are within the recommendations provided on the previous slide. We probably need to drop her to a D50 solution. The Aspen guidelines suggest a standard form to use when ordering parenteral nutrition to assure the correct mixture delivery, and monitoring. They should also bear a standard label on the product. And this is pretty easy to do with hospital systems. There's also mandatory labeling that should be done to assure that the patient gets the correct feeding formulary. So let's do a little practice. A patient on parental nutrition is fed 7.5% aminosin and 17.5% dextrose in a 2-in-1 solution at 65 mils an hour. He gets a piggyback of 250 mils of a 20% IV fat emulsion. How many calories is he getting per day? You can find the page in your textbook that helps you calculate this, or you can use the information that I've presented here. The answer for fluid he's getting 1,560 mils of total fluid. A 17.5% dextrose solution has 17.5 grams of carb in 100 mil. So we say 17.5 times 15.6 and that's giving the patient 273 grams of carbohydrate. At 3.4 calories per gram, the patient's getting 928 calories from glucose. The 7.5% amino acid solution has 7.5 grams per 100 ml. So the patient is getting 468 calories from protein. The 250 mL of 20% IV fat emulsion has 500 calories. And so there's your total for 24 hours. I also want to mention that parenteral nutrition can come as a 3-in-1 solution or a 2-in-1. What's the difference? 
A three-in-one solution has the carb, fat, and protein all in one bag. A two-in-one gives you carbohydrates and proteins, and then you add fat as a separate piggyback. The advantages of a three-in-one is that you get everything prepared aseptically by the pharmacy. It's more efficient, less time is needed by nursing, less supply expense because you only need one pump, one tube, and it's better tolerated in some patients. However, a three-in-one will need large bore tubing. You're unable to use a bacteria eliminating filter. The mixture is less stable. It's difficult to notice precipitation in this opaque mixture because of the fat. And medications are incompatible with a lipid. Catheter occlusion is more common. The good news about this occlusion business is that a 70% alcohol solution is effective for cleaning catheters occluded by fat because fats are soluble in alcohol. Use of a 3-in-1 with evidence of aggregation is depicted on this slide. Coalescence or cracking may be harmful to the patient. Now if you see mild creaming, as you see here, uh, you can gently shake the solution and cause the lipid particles to disperse and that should take care of it. However, if it reappears after one or two hours, the lipid particles may have become too large to be redispersed. In this case, it's unsafe to use because large triglyceride particles can potentially cause a lipid emboli or pulmonary capillary occlusion. So it's important to closely inspect 3-in-1s for sign of lipid destabilization. Do not use them if they become destabilized during administration. Discontinue it immediately. This is a marbled appearance due to triglyceride clumping within the solution. Sometimes eggs are added to 3-in-1 solutions as an emulsifier. It's important to note that if someone has an egg allergy, they should not be given these solutions. It's also important to note that IV fat emulsions are significant but inconsistent source of vitamin K. So watch for this in your patients on Coumadin monitor their PT. IV fat emulsions must have essential fatty acids, linoleic and linolenic acids added. Monitor for essential fatty, essential fatty acid deficiency. To prevent the adverse effects of IV fat emulsion, do not give it when triglycerides are more than 400 in adults and more than 200 in neonates. Deliver it slowly. Phospholipids are higher in a 10%, so whenever possible, use a 20% IVFE. However, if a patient is sedated with propofol, you'll have to use a 10% solution because propofol provides 1.1 calories of fat per meal. If a patient continues to receive IV fat and their triglycerides are elevated, they could develop pancreatitis, immunosuppression, an alteration in pulmonary function, and jaundice. There's some evidence that patients who cannot tolerate adequate IV fat emulsions can be given safflower or soybean oil applications directly to the skin twice a week. The question on the slide says, how long can an IVFE hang? It can hang as a part of a two-in-one solution for 24 hours. Every patient situation must be taken into account when providing parental nutrition. Careful monitoring and adjustments will prevent adverse events and complications. Use of nutrition support teams reduces adverse events and death from metabolic complications. This slide, for example, demonstrates the differences that must be accounted for when feeding critically ill and stable patients. 
A patient who is not hemodynamically stable cannot be fed until they are. Critically ill patients should receive no more than 60% of their total calories of dextrose and preferably only 4 milligrams per kilogram per minute. So again, we have to take in different considerations for critically ill versus stable patients. It's important to establish particular fluid requirements. Generally, the guidelines are 30 to 40 mils per kilo per day, but there are conditions where there'd be less or more fluids. Long-term complications of parental nutrition are associated mainly with home TPN. They are increased risk in patients who have Crohn's, cancer, and short gut. These are things that we should monitor. Many drugs used with parental nutrition can cause aluminum toxicity. It's important to check these because aluminum toxicity can cause the bone disease that's associated with long-term TPN. Also, calcium deficiency is high in patients who've been on long-term parental nutrition. It's important not to exceed protein because it can also cause calcium losses. Metabolic acidosis impairs vitamin D metabolism. So it's important to maintain proper pH balance. Rapid infusion of an IV with sodium or potassium can cause tetany because of an abrupt drop in serum calcium. Metabolic acidosis can be caused by nasal suctioning, volume depletion, and diuretics. It's also caused by increased chloride levels, diarrhea, and ARF. Hallmarks of metabolic acidosis are decreased pH, decreased bicarb with normal packed CO2. Here's a case presentation. We have a 68-year-old critically ill patient with arterial blood gases pH 7.31, pack CO2 of 36, and bicarb of 20. What's the problem? The pH and bicarb are dropping. This suggests metabolic acidosis. We would give the patient acetate. It's converted to bicarb in the liver, which will buffer the blood. Here's another case. The arterial blood gases for a PN patient, we have a pH of 7.32, pack CO2 of 49, a bicarb of 29. This patient is demonstrating respiratory acidosis. We need to check how many calories the patient's getting. It's likely he or she is being overfed. Check the calories per kilo and check the RQ if the patient's on a vent. Vented patients only need 25 to 35 calories per kilo per day. I want to mention though that permissive underfeeding in obese ICU patients is allowed. We provide calories at the resting metabolic rate. It's associated with improved outcomes and without risk of respiratory acidosis. Hyperglycemia is associated with hypertonic hyponatremia because of high glucose pulling water from the vascular space. This causes dilutional hyponatremia. For every 100 milligrams per deciliter elevation above 100 in glucose, serum, serum sodium will drop 1.6 milliequivalents per liter. There's a very linear relationship between these two. Obesity, pancreatitis, and cirrhosis are risk factors for hyperglycemia in parentally nutrition fed patients. Cyclic PN also increases the risk. Transitioning a patient off of TPN to a tube feeding can also cause hyperglycemia. So, prevention is the key. Keep the blood sugar between somewhere between 110 and 150 and monitor. And then of course there are algorithms in place that hospitals use to treat and prevent hyperglycemia in their patients. Of course, hypoglycemia can be a problem. 
It occurs when elevated endogenous insulin doesn't adjust to reduce dextrose if we stop the parenteral nutrition too quickly. Although rare, it is more likely in patients who are starved, malnourished, have liver disease, or hypothyroidism. This is very easily prevented by tapering the parenteral nutrition. I also want to mention that there is a condition called parental nutrition associated liver disease. Three different types and patients who are at risk are those with short bowel, those treated with cyclic PN, and we need to wean as soon as possible to preserve the intestinal integrity of the gut. Note that in gallbladder disease and in long-term PN, manganese toxicity may occur because the bladder, gallbladder can't excrete manganese. Manganese toxicity causes tremor and rigidity. Watch for this, especially in long-term patients on TPN. Refeeding syndrome is a problem with parenterally fed patients. Dextrose infusion increases the demands for thiamine. Folate may be needed too. That's why it's very important to give a patient thiamine whenever you begin TPN. This is an example of a nutrition screening uh, that is used to identify patients at risk for refeeding syndrome. In other words, those patients that we would need to start slowly that we would need to make sure that they got thiamine and folate. There are also complications with specialized nutrition support that involve minerals. Hyper and hypokalemia. It's important that we don't give manganese or copper for patients who are on parental nutrition and end-stage liver disease because they're unable to excrete it. Patients with a high ostomy output will need extra sodium. Three in one solutions have to be given iron separately, and we talked earlier about aluminum, and to aluminum toxicity and calcium problems in patients who've been on TPN for a long time. We also have to think about all the different medications that are incompatible with parenteral nutrition. Pharmacy is usually very good about providing this information. Here's an example of a monitoring algorithm for adult patients on parental nutrition. And here's an example of electrolyte guidelines that should be followed for patients on parental nutrition. Weight changes should be noted. Uh, watch the markers for protein for malnutrition such as albumin or prealbumin. Make sure they're getting an adequate amount and that we have sufficient nitrogen to promote healing. So initiation, progression, and monitoring of our patients on TPN is essential for optimal medical outcomes and to prevent problems. Using the ASPEN guidelines can help avoid complications. And of course, a good communication with a feeding team is always a good idea and know your patient.